This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 112 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, 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 everyone. If you are brand new to the podcast, I am so glad that you found us. And if you've been listening for a while, well, thank you so much for returning for yet another episode. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, it was actually quite a busy week here on the homestead. I actually got quite a bit of stuff accomplished. Very happy about that. As I was thinking about recording this week's episode, I was thinking I'm not going to have much for the homestead happening segment. And then as I started thinking back over the week, I thought, wow, I actually got quite a bit of stuff accomplished. So let's jump right on over to this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on the Homestead. So this week actually started out on Monday with a trip to pick up some hay. The guy that I get my hay from is also getting a half a pig from me. And so what we're doing, instead of trading Benjamins, shall we say, um, we're actually working out a barter system. Uh, Hay for a pig, which I love doing that. I did some bartering last year on uh, on some pork, and uh, that's something that I really, really enjoy doing. So we picked up some of the hay that uh, is a part of that deal and uh, brought it home. And I really felt much better after that because my pig situation this year, as I've shared with you before, has not been up to the standards that I would like. And in part, it's just because I've been fighting mother nature so hard because of all of the rain. And so getting some nice fresh hay to the pigs, uh, it just really felt good. And uh, I was very, very happy that they are now bedded down in some fresh hay. In fact, they need to refresh the bedding again um, because especially the young ones, they've eaten it all up. And uh, so I need to get another bale down to them tomorrow. But uh, anyhow, so we got some fresh hay and then the remaining part of the hay from that load is actually going to be going up to the Ruth stout bed where my chickens have been busy at work, kind of tilling it up. And uh, we're putting that to bed for the winter. One of the other things that I finally got around to doing this week is sorting out the dry beans. Now, when I shelled my dry beans, I didn't really think it through as well as I should have. And I kind of just shelled random beans all together. And then I had a mixture of Cherokee Trail of Tears beans, which is a black bean, pinto beans, and then also golden Jacob's ladder beans. And so they were all mixed together. I wanted to sort them out in part because you kind of use them for a little bit of different things, but then also I really wanted to have a good visual with regards to how much I actually got of each bean. And what I found is that the Cherokee trail of tears was the most prolific bean that I grew this year. And while they are a smaller bean, and I would like a larger black bean, they more than made up for it in the number of beans. In fact, when I was done shelling them, I had, I think, a quart and a half of the Cherokee Trail of Tears beans. And so I think I'm going to actually grow them again next year. I may try another type of black bean to see if I can find one that's maybe a little bit bigger, but uh, they were certainly, while small, very prolific, and I was very happy with that. The pinto beans, and I actually think I had a mixture of pinto beans and maybe a Mayflower bean. I don't remember exactly. Uh, From that, I got about a quart. The one that I was not very happy with was the Jacob's Ladder bean. Out of all of the beans that I planted, I only got about a half a pint of actual dry beans. Now, that is actually a bush bean. And I was planning on moving away from the bush bean beans for dry beans anyhow, but this certainly confirmed it in my mind that I want to continue growing the pole beans for my dry beans. And then next year, 
I, I do plan on having a little better plan of attack with regards to shelling the beans and not mixing them up. So I have to sort them afterwards because as you know, I hate fiddly things and sorting beans is certainly a fiddly thing, but we got them sorted out and it certainly does give me great information as I start thinking about what I'm going to plant next year uh, variety wise. I finally got around and I know here it is early December and I'm finally dealing with the remainder of the leaves in my yard. I know it's late. I know it's late, but the reason why it's late is because we have a big, huge oak tree in our front yard. And that oak tree is the one that always loses its leaves the last. And so I went ahead and gathered up those leaves and those leaves went on into the Ruth South bed where the chickens are still at. And that'll give them an opportunity to kind of scratch around in them, start breaking them down. And then uh, that will help feed and build that soil there. And I'll cover it all with hay. And then in the springtime, we should be really good to go. You may remember that on the last episode, I shared with you the trials and tribulations I was experiencing with regards to setting up a new pen for our boar, Boris. A friend of mine had offered me their rock drill. And so yesterday I had an opportunity with my son's help to try that out. And folks, I just got nowhere. It was not working at all. And I didn't want to tear up his equipment. I was afraid I was going to injure myself. And so what I just opted to do is to tap out and say, you know what? Mother nature doesn't seem to want to have a pig pen in that area. So what I'm going to do right now is add a bunch of wood chips in with Boris and his girlfriend, Betswine Ross. And it's going to be what it's going to be over the winter. And then hopefully in the spring, I'll be able to come up with another idea, maybe another location where I can move them and I'll be happier than where they're at now. But it just is what it is. So yesterday, Brian, Jay, and I moved, I think, two loads of wood chips up with uh, Boris and Betswine Ross. And certainly their pen is much, much nicer now than it was, but that's just a short-term fix. I know that I've got to come up with a better long-term fix and I'm not quite sure what that's going to be unless maybe what I do is somehow figure out a way to corral Boris in a corner or something and then take one side down and maybe clean out his pen and start from scratch. Not quite sure what I'm going to do, uh, but I know that uh, this is certainly a short-term fix for the problem. But Mother Nature has spoken, and I certainly didn't want to hurt myself and, and certainly didn't want to uh, ruin my friend's rock drill. And uh, so it is what it is. The last thing I wanted to share with you is I finally did get the snowblower fully on the tractor. I was having a little bit of struggle with that for two reasons. Number one, when they used the tractor for the tractor parade, they lost the pins for the sway bars. So I had to go find the right size clevis pin for it. I found that this week. And then uh, I was having some issues getting that PTO shaft to connect up right. I always do. And part of the reason is because I only really do it once a year. And so I always have to watch YouTube videos on how to connect the PTO shaft, which makes me feel really, really dumb. But when you only put it on once a year, it is what it is. And uh, there is a bit of an art to it. Getting that sucker lined up exactly right is a bit of a pain in the butt, but we got it done. So let the snow fly. We are ready to rock and roll snowblower on and uh, we are good to go. All right. Before we head on over to this week's charting the course, I do want to take a moment and thank everybody who filled out the survey last month. I really, really appreciate it. It was very helpful information and feedback. And actually today's episode is in part a response to uh, some of the feedback that I received. We're going to be making some changes to the podcast and to the supporting listeners program as a result of the feedback that I received. So 
thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Your feedback was very, very helpful. Now, I had promised you that I was going to live on the podcast, draw names for the giveaways. However, I made a strategic mistake when I set up the forms, and that is that I never asked anybody for their name. I only asked for their email address. And certainly, I don't feel comfortable uh, giving out anybody's email address on the podcast. (laughs) I have chosen three winners. And uh, so look in your email, the email address that you gave me. If you are one of the winners, uh, congratulations. Thank you to everybody else who did respond and reply. I do greatly appreciate it. And uh, just keep an eye out for some upcoming things as a result of the feedback that I received. All right, let's head on over to this week's Charting the Course. Today's episode actually comes as a result of the survey. I had some people ask me about homesteading books that I would recommend. And I got to thinking that it's still early enough that if you want to add these to your Christmas list, you can. Uh, Maybe these will be some good gift ideas for somebody in your life that is into homesteading. But even if Christmas has come and passed, this list hopefully will be helpful to you. As I was thinking about how to approach this, Initially, I thought about including books on here that maybe I hadn't read personally, but that other people highly recommend. And then I got to thinking, no, Brian, simply speak to what you know. And so this list contains the books that I have either read word for word or at least skim read and feel comfortable in recommending to you. Certainly, I've not read every homesteading book there is to read. And just because a book isn't on this list doesn't mean that I don't recommend it. It simply may mean that I've just not read the book. I am going to do my best to have links to all of these books in the show notes. These will be affiliate links. So if you buy through those links, it does help support the Homestead Journey podcast. And I really appreciate that. But certainly keep your eyes open at yard sales, flea markets, junk shops, Goodwills, because I have seen many of these books in a lot of those places. So let's jump right into it. So in the general homesteading category, my all-time favorite book is the Back to Basics book from Reader's Digest. Now, this is the only book on this list that I believe is no longer in print. So you're going to need to look on like a books or something like that. I think maybe sometimes you can find it on Amazon uh, as well as a used book, but this is the one that is yellow in color. There's another version that's green. I'm not saying that that version is bad. I've just never read it. I've never looked at it. If you've had an opportunity to compare both um, editions of it, let me know which one you like better, but I absolutely love the Reader's Digest, Back to Basics book that came out, I think in like the early 1980s. My mom and dad actually had it when I was a kid. And I just remember looking at that book over and over and over again as a child. I have it now and I periodically enjoy pulling it out and just leafing through it. A great book on general homesteading skills. Another great general homesteading book is The Self-Sufficient Life and How to Live It, The Complete Back to Basics Guide by John Seymour. Uh, Another really, really good book that's uh, a great read and uh, really covers a lot of the general homesteading um, topics and skills that you need. Another book that I really enjoy, it's not as in-depth as Back to Basics or The Self-Sufficient Life and How to Live It. But it is one that I think is a great entry-level book. And that is actually by Harold Thornbro, who I've had on the podcast before. He is of the Modern Homesteading Podcast, which he actually has done away with. He started another podcast. I don't remember what it's called. But anyhow, it's called From Home to Small Town, Homestead, Pursuing Self-Sufficiency and Sustainability No Matter Where You Live. And it's really a very great introduction to homesteading on a small scale. Another great book, and this is more of a reference guide. It's not something that I would say that you would sit down and read from cover to cover, 
but it's more of a book that you would fall back on if you've got a question and you want an answer. And that is the Encyclopedia of Country Living by Carla Emery. And again, as the name suggests, it's the encyclopedia. It's very topical. It's not something that you're just going to sit down and start at page one and read the page. And it's a thick book. Uh, you're going to read all the way through it. At least I wouldn't do that. Maybe you enjoy reading encyclopedias, but uh, it's more of a reference guide. If you've got a question, you look it up nine times out of 10. The answer is going to be in that book. And then another very basic, but I think a very helpful book. I know this was a very helpful book to Jack Polner over at the Mindful Homestead, but that is The Backyard Homestead by Carlene Madigan. And uh, so again, those are great general homesteading books that uh, don't really dive deeply into any one topic, but really give you a great overview of a lot of uh, topics from a homesteading perspective. Moving on to more topical books from a gardening perspective. The first book I recommend is Square Foot Gardening by Mel Bartholomew. As the name implies, it's really the Bible when it comes to the square foot gardening method. That's the method that I use in my raised beds. Um, by and large, I've been very, very happy with it and uh, highly recommend that book. If you're interested at all in raised bed gardening, I would recommend you check out um, Square Foot Gardening by Mel Bartholomew. The next book on gardening is Gardening Without Work by Ruth Stout. This book is not is not quite as much of a how-to from the standpoint of how to garden like Ruth Stout did. It's a little bit more story and less methodology. A great read though, and a lot of insights that you can glean if you are interested at all in any kind of deep mulch type gardening. Her method uses hay, but I think there's a lot of things that you can learn from that book, whether or not you decide to adopt her method full force. And it still is a fun read and a very easy read. So gardening without work. The next book on gardening that I recommend is one that I'm actually rereading right now. And that's Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. And that's a book that really looks at gardening from a permaculture perspective. And so if you're at all interested in permaculture, um, I think it's a great introduction to what permaculture is and how permaculture might be applied on a homesteading scale. And then the last two books that I'm going to recommend from a gardening perspective come from Elliot Coleman, and that's The New Organic Grower and Four Season Harvest. I think both of those books are very, very helpful. And while I have said before on this podcast, I have determined that I am not a four season grower. Um, certainly there's a lot of good information in both of those books. And so I, I would highly recommend them both New Organic Grower and Four Season Harvest by Elliot Coleman. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, Brian, do you have any books that you recommend with regards to raising chickens? And the book that stands out in that area for me is one called Chickens, the Small Scale Poultry Flock, an All Natural Approach to Raising Chickens and Other Fowl for Home and Market Growers by Harvey Usery. It's a really great book. I don't own it. I got it from the library and read it, really enjoyed it, found it chock full of great information. It's one that I eventually want to add to my library, but that is the book that I recommend to people who are new to chickens. I do have stories guide to raising chickens here on my shelf. Uh, I haven't read it yet. And so I'm not going to recommend it, even though um, stories guides to raising animals certainly are highly recommended by a lot of people. I haven't read it yet. So again, not going to recommend it, but uh, you may want to check that one out as well. From a food preservation perspective, uh, first of all, in the canning department, there are two books that I highly recommend. The Ball Blue Book of Canning and then the Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving. Recently, there's been some controversy with regards to the Ball Canning books. Uh, a couple of state extension agencies have taken issue with the fact that Ball doesn't release all of their testing methodologies. And so they've called into question whether or not Ball's recipes are safe. So I, I do want to kind of put that out there. 
I feel confident and I feel comfortable in Ball's track record and the fact that they have a lot riding on the line uh, to be putting out bad recipes. But from my perspective, those two books, the Ball Blue Book of Canning and the Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving are great resources. From a fermentation perspective, I love The Art of Fermentation by Sandor Katz. That's a book that I want to get into my library. I've read it actually a couple of times. I got it from the library and it's a thick book. It'll take you a while to get through it, but uh, I really, really enjoy that book and it was revolutionary to me. So I certainly would recommend it to you. Now there's a couple of books on food. I wasn't quite sure how to put these into a category. So I'm just calling them books on food, but these were a couple of books that challenged the conventional narrative with regards to food that I really found helpful. The first one is called Nourishing Traditions, uh, the cookbook that challenges politically correct nutrition and diet, Dictocrats by Sally Fallon. And uh, re highly recommend that book. It's a very, very interesting book. And then uh, another book that I really enjoyed is called The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully by Aaron Carroll. Both of those really challenge some of the preconceived notions that I had with regards to food. And do I necessarily subscribe to everything that I read in those books? No, but I, I did really enjoy them uh, from the standpoint that they challenged some of my preconceived notions and got me to think a little bit differently about food. And so I found them to be very helpful and I highly recommend both of those. The last topic that I wanted to include some books from was the autobiography slash biography category. The first book in this category is one called Coop, A Family of Farm in the Pursuit of One Good Egg by Michael Perry. This was a book that I actually picked up on a lark at uh, an, an independent bookstore and really, really enjoyed it. And it's really the story of a family that left suburbia and started an egg business. And I really, really enjoyed that book. Another book that I found very, very enjoyable is Saving the Guinea Hogs, The Recovery of American Homestead Breed by Kathy Payne, which is a look at the story of the American guinea hog. And so certainly as an American guinea hog breeder, I found it very, very interesting and very helpful to understand the background and some of the stories of the people who raised American guinea hogs back in the day. But I really think that for any homesteader who is interested at all in breed recovery, regardless of whether or not it is the American guinea hog or not, I think it's a very great book, uh, an enjoyable book to, uh, to have in your library. Another book that I really, really enjoyed is one called Up Tunket Road, The Education of a Modern Homesteader by Philip Ackerman Leist. And that is the story of uh, a guy and his wife and eventually his family that uh, moved to Vermont and started a homestead off grid uh, on the top of a hill. I really enjoyed that book. I really enjoyed the way that uh, he shared their story. And in fact, they don't live that far from me. Um, one of these days, I really would like to uh, connect up with him and um, learn more about their story. They actually raise American milking Devons. And that's a breed that I'm interested in someday perhaps raising on our homestead, although that does mean that I'm going to need to acquire more property. And uh, so that's part of the reason why I haven't pursued it that far, but certainly I did enjoy that book. And then maybe this is a bit of a push to put this on this list, but I think every homesteader really should read the Little House on the Prairie series. At least Farmer Boy, if no other book from the series, at least Farmer Boy. Um, but I've, uh, I have probably read the entire series from beginning to end 15 times, maybe more. I don't know. When Brian J was younger, I don't remember, maybe six, seven, we actually read the entire series together uh, at night. And I really enjoyed going through it with him. And then we actually had the opportunity to go to Malone and to visit the, uh, homestead, uh, that's talked about in uh, farmer boy. And that, that was really cool. But 
I really do think that every homesteader should read at least Farmer Boy from the Little House on the Prairie series. But uh, I would recommend you read the entire series from beginning to end. I know it's a children's series, but I enjoy it. And uh, who knows, I may go ahead and reread it again. I really do enjoy it. So those are the books that I recommend that I have read myself and have enjoyed and think that most people would find them helpful. Let me also share with you a few of the books that I currently have in my to read stack. Now, I did mention that I am rereading Gaia's Garden. That's the book that I am reading through right now. I had borrowed it from the library several years ago and had lightly read through it. I didn't get to dive into it like I wanted to before I had to take it back. And so I bought it this past year with the idea that it was going to be the first book that I was going to read this winter. And so I'm about halfway through it right now. I also have in my queue the Pure Charcuterie and Ethical Meat Handbook from Meredith Lee. I actually have started reading both of them, but I have not finished them. And so because of that, I, I didn't add them to my list, even though what I've read so far, I do highly recommend both of them. Another book that I have in my stack, and it's actually my most recent acquisition, is the Polyface Micro book by Joel Salatin. Now, you might be surprised that I didn't include any of Joel's books in my list at all. That's certainly not a knock on Joel's books. If you are a Joel Salatin fan, please, please, please do not get upset at me. <laughs> I'm not banging on Joel Salatin. He has been a great inspiration to many, many homesteaders. I haven't read all of his books. The ones that I have read, like Salad Bar Beef, for example, are not ones that I feel like apply to the small scale producer or homesteader. Not to say that there isn't stuff that you can take from his books, but I'm excited to read Polyface Micro because it has been written specifically to the homesteading community. And I'm excited about reading that. And then another book that I have in my list actually comes as a recommendation from Joel Salatin. Uh, and that is The Complete Book of Composting, which is edited by J.I. Rodell. And so I'm going to be working my way through that this winter. But those are some of the books that I have currently in my queue. And if there are books that you have found helpful in any of the categories that I've mentioned, or maybe there's a category that I overlooked, email me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. And if it looks interesting to me, I will drop it in my queue and um, see if I can get it from my library or go ahead and buy it online. Again, I will have links to all of these books in the show notes. They are affiliate links. But before you go out and buy them, my recommendation to you is this. Unless you want these for Christmas or this is something that you know for sure that you want to have for your library, I would recommend that you see if you can get them from your local library and try before you buy. Read them. See if you find them helpful. It may be something that you read at once and you say, ah, that doesn't really interest me. It doesn't really speak to me. And you move on. Or it may be something that you really, really like. And you're like, yes, I got to have that for my library. Now, at that point, go ahead and buy it. But before you buy it brand new through my affiliate links, I would recommend that you look at abooks.com or see if you can find them in a used bookstore, et cetera. Certainly, if you buy them through the affiliate links, I would be greatly appreciative, but I also want to help you maximize your homesteading dollars. And so if you can read them for free, do so. Um, and if you can find them uh, for cheap, do it that way. Last resort should be buying them new through my affiliate links. All right, folks, I hope you found this helpful. Any questions, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Again, if there's something that I missed, or maybe there's a book that I recommended that you think I shouldn't have recommended it. I'd also love to hear from you in that regard as well. That's all for this week, folks. We will catch you on the next episode. Brian can be reached by emailing him at brian at thehomesteadjourney.net or by contacting him via our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support this podcast, we invite you to become a member of the Supporting Listeners Program. For $10 a month or $100 per year, you will receive access to a community of like-minded individuals via a private Facebook group. 
at least one monthly live Q&A with Brian, the opportunity to participate in live recordings of the podcast, access to an ever-expanding library of helpful homesteading content, and so much more. Head on over to support.thehomesteadjourney.net for more information and to sign up today. As always, the music on this episode was provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.